Since the start of the pandemic, public schools have been under a microscope, magnifying the conversations that are truly taking place inside of the classroom and within the administrative offices. But before the pandemic, our public school system wasn't doing as well as it should be. So what can we do to fix it? Welcome to another episode of Counterthought. This is a special episode because I have a guest with me today. I'll bring her on in a couple of minutes, but first I want to talk about our public school system. As I said in the lead in, our public school system has been under a microscope since the start of the pandemic going back now two years. Kids were sent home and what that allowed to happen was for parents to see and hear some of the conversations that were taking place inside of their children's classrooms. Parents didn't like that. So then what happened after that, as we all know, parents started going to school board meetings and becoming more involved, more active in their child's education. And all of these woke ideologies were being shared. I'm sure we're most familiar with parents protesting the DOJ, considering certain parents who do protest or threaten violence to be domestic terrorists. All of that has happened in the news in the last one to two years. Over these last two years, homeschooling has become even more and more popular. It may not be the first choice because obviously when you homeschool, a parent has to stay home. And in some cases, children are now being homeschooled by their parent when the parent wasn't actually staying at home before the parent was a working parent. Now the parent is a teaching parent. A lot of people love homeschool, but with that, you make certain sacrifices. I have a friend of mine who is now a stay at home mom, was not a stay at home mom beforehand, and is now tasked with teaching her children at home. But I think a lot of us, or at least myself, I want to be able to rely upon and entrust the public school system to be able to educate my children just as I was educated by the public school system when I was a kid. When I was a kid, this this political ideology, you know, woke ideology, it, it didn't exist. And if it did exist, I wasn't aware of it. Maybe it didn't exist where, where I grew up. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a smaller town, you know, I wasn't in a big city and so on and so forth. The teachers, I think at my school, they, they were not part of these large teachers unions like the NEA and the um, AFT. But I want a good education for my kids. I don't want to say, oh man, I have to send, have to send my children to a private school because I can't trust the public school. I, I don't want to, I don't want to be put into that, that situation. I don't want to be boxed in. I want homeschooling. I want private education. I want public education, charter schools, these special magnet programs. I want all of those to be available and not really have not really be steered or forced to go one way because the other way is, is no good. I want all options to be good. I will say, just like I've said in other episodes that the pandemic has put a, or brought shown to me, brought to light how important your local government is and your local school board as it pertains to this episode. You know, I, I didn't really think twice about it. Maybe it's because my children are still too young, but you know, now that I'm aware of, of what is going on in certain school systems, certain states and, and everything else, I'm going to be paying a lot more attention to what is going on in my county, in my school system. I met with a candidate last week for the Orange County School Board Chair. Sounds like a great man. I agree with a lot of the things he said, if not everything he was saying. And he described to me how the relationship with a school board chair is with the superintendent. So all of this is very, very important if you are, you are a parent. Even if you're not a parent right now, but you plan on having children, you know, you want the structure to be in place for your child to get a great education. But our school system prior to the pandemic hasn't really been educating our children to the level based on the amount of resources that we put into the education of our children. 
And not all resources are created equal, right? The funds are not distributed evenly. And I think that's part of the problem as well. So there are a lot of moving pieces and parts, right, that go into this. A lot of moving pieces and parts. It's not just one, one change that's going to fix everything. Some quick statistics for you. In 2018, there were 48 million children that were enrolled in public school, K through 12. 6 million in private school. Also in 2018, the school enrollment included 4 million kindergartners. Again, this is of the 48 million and the 6 million. 32.8 or 33 million students first through eighth grade, and then 17 million high schoolers. In the school year of 2019 through 2020, which you know was cut a little bit, a couple months short, there were 3.2 million teachers in public schools and 500,000 teachers in private schools. For those 48 million children in public schools, there was $667 billion spent, $667 billion of expenditures for K through 12 during that 2018, 2019 school year. And then that breaks down to approximately $13,000 per student in K through 12 public schools. $13,000 per child, K through 12 public schools. And also over the last two years, a lot of attention has been given to these teachers unions. Like I said, the NEA and the AFT, they're the two top teachers unions across the United States. Collectively, they have about 4.7 to 5 million members. Not all of them are teachers, however, but they are spread across 14, to 16,000 different communities across our country. Approximately 4 million educators. And I would say the most popular leader of these two unions was Randy Weingarten. Randy Weingarten got all of the headlines because she was the most outspoken. It was revealed that the that she leads the NEA and the NEA was working with the CDC to set these guidelines for back to school. Some states like Florida went back to school early you know, remote learning was done. It was going back to the classroom. Other states, I believe like Ohio, had hybrid learning where you could maybe three days at home, three days in school. And then you could choose after that. Other states were at home for much longer. And a lot of the press that was going on for these teachers unions, specifically the NEA and Randy Weingarten, was that they wanted like everything. They wanted everything advocating for the teachers, right? That's their job as a union. But I think the expectation from the public was for there to be more advocacy, more concern for the children. But we kept hearing and seeing and reading that, hey, like, we need billions of dollars in order to outfit these schools and these classrooms. And then once that was given to the to the unions, then they wanted every teacher to have to be vaccinated and they wanted children to wear masks. Even though science was showing that children were not large vectors of transmission, you could go back in time and show, you know, this county required masks for children, this county did not. They're next door to one another, and then you would see no difference in the spread of the virus. More and more studies are now showing and revealing that masking is actually causing developmental delays for children's speech. Being stuck at home, especially like in the lower, um, income communities where, you know, you may not have great internet access, you may not have an adult who can stay home and educate the children, the children are just basically sitting and sitting at home and, and not learning that this is going to have effects for this entire generation, you know, for decades to come, negative consequences of, of these decisions. And I'm not here to blame every teacher because my mom is a teacher. She was not part of a union, but some teachers are, like in her school district where she was. But there are more than three million, three to four million educators that are part of these two unions, and they carry a lot of weight. And it seemed like they were putting themselves first over the education of the children. And I think most, if not all, parents want their child to be put first, and it be up to the teachers to make the sacrifices, not the children. The education levels that are 
currently in place here in the U.S. If you look, ages 25 and over between 1940 and 2021, right? A lot more people had less than a high school education. But at schools, if there have been more and more schools, more and more education system put in place. Now it's 20%. Sorry, not 20%, 20 million. I read that wrong. High school to some college, 119 million have that level of education. And then a bachelor's degree or higher, 85 million. And then this next chart on the screen, this is the percentage. Now that I got this right, going back to 1940, you know, 76% were educated less than high school. 2021, 9%. High school and some college education, 19% to 53%. So all of these are improving more and more education. And that is what we want for our children more and more education. We want our children to produce and be at the top levels. But when compared the United States to other countries, we are not there. We are not in the top 10, even though we are one of the, the most, if not the most developed countries in the world. So there are things that we need to discuss regarding our public education system. There are improvements that need to be made. And that brings me to my guest today, Erica Holzer. Erica is going to be joining me here right now. Let me go ahead and, and bring her into the episode. Erica Holzer is a Gen Z conservative, and I'm just fascinated with the number of uh, Gen Zers that I see being involved in the political and societal and cultural discussions. Erica is a junior at the University of Alabama studying political science and criminal justice with intentions to go to law school in the future. Uh, Erica was also a TPUSA campus coordinator as a freshman. And Erica, you shared with me that that really opened your eyes to what is happening on college campuses and that even in the deep south of Alabama, that you know, what we've seen and heard about more and more on the news, especially within politics and culture and school, that even the deep southern states like Alabama, even those colleges are not, are not free or not safe from it. So can you just tell me first a little bit more about, about that experience? Yeah, so working with Turning Point was great. I fell in love with it while I was in high school, got the opportunity to work for them my freshman year of college. And right away, I saw a big change whenever I moved from Pittsburgh to the South. The people outside of the university, very conservative, um, religious values. But as soon as you step foot onto the university, it's a flip. Um, you go from seeing, you know, people with normal hair colors to blue, purple, you name it, every color of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. And that was just something I wasn't expecting. Um, my freshman year was covid COVID year. So I wasn't able to do a ton of events on campus. However, the one that I got to organize was the Isabel Brown event who, um, she works with turning point. She's a, she's a podcaster too. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I follow her on Instagram. <laughs> she's amazing. So sweet. Um, but that event was protested very heavily to my surprise because okay. it wasn't even on campus. We uh, were told that it wasn't allowed to be on campus due to COVID, but I think there were underlying reasons. Mm -hmm. um, this upcoming year, I didn't work with Turning Point. I was still involved helping the chapter wherever I could. We had Charlie Kirk on campus, which it was a much bigger event. Um, we had it on campus at Hotel Capstone, which is the hotel on campus, and they protested outside of it for three hours. Mm -hmm. um, the security we needed for that event was very expensive, number one. Um, it was intense. Everybody had to go through metal detectors, which I'm happy about that. But um, we had to print out names of the, they made like a group chat of people going to um, protest this event. And we had to print out like their names, pictures, because they were trying to come into the event, cause problems. Oh, really? hmm. Yeah. So overall, just a shock to me that the Deep South that people would even want to go to college in the deep South that are left leaning, mm -hmm. but they do. Yes. Yeah, so it was like a, your own bouncer at the event, right? <laughs> so you hear like a, a no fly list, so to speak, like, you know, no fly zone in here. I went to the university of Florida. I know I mentioned that to you in one of our preliminary calls for before this right. interview. Um, and I, I graduated before you on Gen Y, you know, a millennial, so I'm a little further removed and it's a little, you know, been more time since I was in school, but I do remember, I want to say going back maybe 
three years ago or so. Um, you know, Trump was still president and his oldest son, Don Jr., you know, is making the rounds, like starting to do campaigning and I think, you know, raise money for his his super PAC or whatever he had going on at the time. And Don Jr. and his girlfriend, maybe they're still together, Kimberly Guilfoyle of Fox News, formerly Fox News, they were doing an event at the University of Florida. And so I'm reading the news articles leading up to it. And sure enough, it's talking about, you know, protesters and questioning whether or not the organization at the at school, which I don't remember the name of it, but whether or not they were allowed, I guess, or if they followed the rules to be able to have an event like this. And for me, like I'm new to to politics and everything else. I my first love, I would say, was was sports and everything else. So like I'll I'll go to a sporting event for three hours, but <laughs> but I've yet to find something and, and maybe it's maybe it's not even a lack of passion. Maybe it's just that like I believe that people can say what they want to say, but to get so upset to go to some to go somewhere to go to an event and protest for like three hours, that's not that's not in me. So I just I I guess my whole point of that story is that I just find it I find it, I guess, maybe I don't know, unusual or, or crazy is not the right word, but that people will take, you know, three hours of their of their life, you know, a good <laughs> chunk of their day to go protest when they know they're not going to be inside right right? and they're going to be with like-minded people so i guess is is that just kind of is it just like a a fear tactic you know just trying to get the university to to cave in to to bow down and potentially cancel events like that yeah i think it i i do think so because um they were upset. silencing speech, so to, so to speak. Right. Uh, they were upset we were even having it on campus. That was a huge concern for them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we let them sit outside our event and we gave them that freedom, their freedom of speech to do that. And they wanted to control ours by having an event that they weren't invited to. They weren't forced to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just really strange to me that people, you know, don't have anything better to do, but each yeah, own. yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Like, just let people do what they want to do. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't really see it. Don't understand it, but maybe one day I will. Um, for me going, I guess, getting now into like the public school conversation for me, I, I grew up in public school. Um, I guess the only private school I ever went to was, was my preschool, you know, which is like affiliated with a, a local church in my hometown. But um, started in first grade through 12th grade public school. My schools actually were all within like five minutes of my house and they were within, I guess they would be considered the, the better, like the best or better school within the district, like for elementary, middle and high school. And I was very thankful for that, you know, based on zoning and everything else. But I finished high school in 2004. Okay. So like I said at the top, there's, a difference a whole generation between you and I right. so I finished 18 years ago so as hard as that is for me to say but for for me at that time it, it seemed fine like we were able and I was in Florida maybe that had something to do with it I'm, I don't know I think there's a lot of moving parts a lot of components but as a student at that time it didn't I don't think any of this was an issue it seemed like school was kind of like a safe space you know free from influences of of politics and society that was, you know, swirling around it. It just like sports used to be that way in other, you know, types of industries or, you know, parts of, of American culture. But what do you remember growing up in school? Um, Was, do you remember seeing any of this? I know you graduated just a couple of years ago from high school, but do you remember experiencing any of this as a student? Well, I graduated in 2020. So I was in high school whenever Trump was elected, which oh, that is true. That's really true. was, um, I'd say, a major shift in mm-hmm. schools. Um, that's kind of whenever you started to get teachers sharing their political views, teachers pushing their political views. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to say that was my freshman year. My freshman year of high school is whenever Trump won the presidency. After that, it got worse. Um, 
everything from pushing Marxism and socialism in schools, telling us that's normal, that's not a death sentence, it would work here in the U.S. And then, you know, you question, well, where how, where, where has it worked anywhere else in the world? And You had some of your teachers were saying those things to you in class or your, to, to your whole class? Yeah, yeah. I really? had a teacher specifically, he taught my AP composition class and he was possibly the most left-leaning person I've ever met in my life. And um, I've had conversations with other teachers that um, lean more right. And they're like, I blame him for turning so many students into that like woke culture. I mean, hmm. like one of the first assignments in the class was to, and it, it's, an, it's a college course on English. Like, but um, the first assignment was to go home and watch the news and then decide the bias for each news source. Mm. how does that correlate to anything related to To English? English. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I remember, sorry to cut you off. I remember the only time I ever had like a homework assignment to where I, where I had to watch the news was in middle school um, in a, in a gifted program I was in, I think it was maybe sixth or seventh grade. We had this, I think it was a weekly assignment for whatever, how many kids, like 16 kids, 20 kids or something like that in the class. And we had to go home, watch the news, get like three news stories. And then, you know, whatever day it was that week, like on a Wednesday or something like that, every kid had to bring in their news stories. And we're like in a circle within the classroom, we had to share the news stories. And that was, that was it. And we had to be able to to talk about, I think each like for a minute on whatever news story we were sharing. And then I think the teacher could ask questions or maybe the other students could ask, could ask questions, but it never went into politics but that was like the only time i was ever told to have to watch the news right so i guess i was oblivious to everything else that was going on except for whenever that was sixth or seventh grade it didn't seem like anything was pushed upon me you know like right right yeah it was a surprise to me too um just because i grew up i knew where i stood politically young i mean my family owns Mm -hmm. a small business my entire family are conservatives and even though that's what we believe, we didn't push it on other people. It wasn't a topic of discussion at the dinner table. It wasn't a topic of discussion at school anywhere. Right. Um, And then for it to become so normalized to bring it up whenever you can, even in school, which bothered me because they can't talk about Christianity, God forbid, but let's talk about, you know, politics, which just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that we're going to get into that a little bit about uh, a little bit later on in in the interview. But why do you think, and this is speculation, but why do you think so many teachers now, because again, I don't want to say all teachers. My my mom was a teacher. You shared with me that your dad was and still is a teacher. But what do you think makes these teachers, these certain teachers feel compelled to push their political beliefs, their personal beliefs, you know, their different ideologies, whatever they subscribe to, onto the children in their classroom? I believe a lot of it's Mm -hmm. fear-based. The fear of the teacher's union, which has become so woke in the past two or three years. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think the idea that college was necessary whenever they graduated um, high school, the idea that college was the ultimatum. And I think that's when a lot of that generation became more left-leaning, more um, compromisable to new ideas. And Mm -hmm. I think they're more willing to follow the left because it's, it's fear-based number one, but it's also what everybody else is doing. You know, it's, you know, college was number one, like everybody's going to college, college is the ultimatum. Well, now this new ideology of, you know, it's not even the left anymore. It's so far left that it's almost backwards. Yeah. Um, and I think starting to follow that and then, you know, they become teachers and then they join the union and, you know, with the union being so left leaning, I don't think they really get an option. I think it's, it's almost indoctrin- indoctrined into the curriculum within schools. Mm-hmm. I think the left is like a lobbyist or the, I think the school system in the U S right now is lobbyist for the left. Yeah, we, um, and I shared this in, in the opening before I brought you on, but you know, one of the things that was revealed to us when it came, I think it started in 
maybe the emails or whatever the conversations happened in late in 2020 but it was revealed in 2021 that you know randy weingarten the leader of one of the lar- two largest teachers unions her teachers union was having direct conversations and basically dictating what policies were going to be put in place and recommendations made by the cdc <laughs> You know, and was calling like we need to have protections for all of our teachers. And then once, you know, this, the check was signed from our federal government, like, hey, here's your billions of dollars for the schools to be outfitted for the desks, the classrooms, you know, masks and everything else. It's like, OK, everything's checked. You even, you know, for the shots, your teachers have the opportunity to get the shots. And then still she's calling like, oh, well you know, basically a zero COVID mentality of, you know, we're not, I don't want the teachers to go back until basically until there's no chance of, of COVID being spread. And it's like, um, that's impossible. (laughs) Right. You know, that's, that's impossible. That's been proven, but it just revealed at least for her. And, you know, she leads a union that has approximately 3 million educators that the educators were coming first. And I, I understand that it's a union, but you would like to see that if there are sacrifices that are going to be made, it would be made by the adults, by the unions, because they want the children to be first. Right. And at least for her and in, in her teacher union, that's not what we were seeing. And still to this day, I would argue that that's still not the case. It's the teachers first, but just, you know, just kind of piggybacking off what you're saying, like lobbying, you know, they're just so, that that union at least is so like entrenched with with politics it's the kids are put on the back burner and it is those kids that we are now seeing with more studies that are experiencing like developmental delays if they are super young you know not being able to see the lips of their teachers move if they're like in daycare or preschool right. it's the education that they missed out on especially for lower income you know like areas of of school systems and school boards and everything else you know, they, they don't get enough money anyway. And so most likely both teachers or both parents or one parent is, you know, teaching a single parent and they don't have that oversight at home to really get the education that they need. So now it's being said that this generation, this younger generation is going to be suffering this effects for decades to come. So when you were growing up in school, again, I'm, I don't want to trash public school because I'm a product of public school and I think I turned out okay. So <laughs> um, what are, we've focused a lot on the negative to start with the present day, but what are the pos- some of the positives and negatives that you take away from your time in, in public school growing up, you know, K through 12? I would say the diversity that you see within a public school, whether that's different social classes, whether that's mm-hmm. Um, you know, political views that prepares you later in life. You're used to seeing it. You're accustomed to talking to people with different views. You don't have to like them, but um, at least you're used to it where I feel like a private school has a more. More similarities between the the students. Cause I I swear like you're reading off my notes (laughs) when you, (laughs) when you said like the, the diversity of the, of the students and everything in a public school, that was the first thing that came to mind whenever I was jotting it down for myself. Yeah. And I think that was the biggest thing for me. I think that prepared me more for college just because I knew what it was like to deal with people with different beliefs, but I have friends that went to private schools and then went to college and it, it was just a shock to them, you know, that people even had different views that people, you know, like, They've never seen that economic class that doesn't have anything, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think growing up and seeing that within public school made me a well, a well-rounded person altogether. Yeah. Like I've never attended a private school, so I can't speak to it, but I know for public school and maybe you'll agree. Like, I don't want to say classes, that's not the right term, but the different cliques and stuff that form within schools, you know, you have so many different types of kids based upon their, their interests and, or, you know, like their family's income and and so on and so forth. It's, it's this diversity in this melting pot, which I think ironically is, is what everyone is advocating for, especially those who are like ardent on the left They you know, like, Oh, we need diversity and, and, and inclusion and, and equity and everything else. And it's like, well, 
I thought we had that with with public schools. So, but so, but then you had to go and you know, like start cramming stuff down the children's throats, and you couldn't just just teach the subject matter. Like your example, that right. first assignment from your English teacher was to go watch the news and point out the bias. I mean, I could see maybe if it was like journalism, but not not like in, in basic English, you know, kind of like 101 or AP or like, like you said, it was just kind of out of the, the scope of, I guess, the coursework. Right. And maybe that's has brought us to a point to where, you know, like we spend a little more than $13,000 per student in the public education system. And that is, I think, the most, if you go like across the developed, developed nations in the world, but yet when it comes to rankings, like as proficiency for education, we are out, we as in the United States of America are out of outside of the top 10, right. even though we spend the most money. So I guess I have two questions for you then. When you finished high school and you, you know, went on to college, did you feel like you were prepared one and then two what do you think could or should be changed maybe in the the education style that we currently have set up within our system here in America I do feel like I was prepared pretty well for college um if I'm being honest with you I think college is easier than high school which I think a lot of people may disagree, but I am also a political science major and not engineering or finance. So, um, but I mean, I always liked learning, so I didn't have a problem with, you know, waking up and going to class, you know, things that some people might, might struggle with in college, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed just, you know, walking on campus. So I, I do think I was prepared well for college, but I also think in high school, you're formative. I think it's what you make of it. Mm -hmm. If, you want to, you know, not do anything and graduate with a 2.0 GPA, you can do that. Right. But if you, you know, take the time out of your day when you get home from school to, you know, actually learn the material, I think it's actually beneficial. As for like the criteria of what they're teaching in history classes and, you know, my English class, uh, I don't consider that very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Um. And to answer your second question about, you know, like what I think is, I guess, wrong or is that what you're saying? Like wrong or um, could change? I guess why, why does it seem like if we're, <clears throat> why are the students, if we're spending so much on the kids and I, I'm well aware of the administrative costs that go into school, right? Like there's a whole lot of money that goes to administrative things, but you would think there would be some type of like positive correlation between, Hey, you spend the most money on your education that you're going to then have the best education. So that may have a couple of things that go, that go into that to cause the United States to be outside of the top 10 and like in reading and mathematics and, and science and things like that, other subjects like that. But my question was, do you, I guess, is there anything that sticks out like from your more like from your time in school to where like you if, if you're in the classroom you're thinking like you know what maybe like this isn't maybe how I learn best or hey this isn't something that I'm probably going to need in the future is it just geared towards standardized testing is instead of critical thinking are we <clears throat> are we focusing as a school system too much on just knowing information knowing information like general knowledge and and not enough on i guess actually things that we will use in the future like is there stuff we're being taught that we shouldn't be taught you know i, I don't know i think there's a lot of pieces to it but is there anything that sticks out to you to where you would say hey i would if i was the superintendent you know or if i led the department of education i would change this i would make public schools less about memorization I think a lot of school is, if you memorize this, you know, you're going to get this grade. That's not learning. That's the one thing I've learned most in college is, yeah, you can memorize it and take the test, but it doesn't benefit you whatsoever. You're going to forget it the next time you have to memorize something else. Um, but I also think that taking Christianity out of schools, whenever our nation was founded upon it, like you can't expect to take Christianity out, of, Christianity out of schools and not have chaos. 
you know, in mm-hmm. schools now you see drug dogs, you see metal detectors, police officers with, you know, guns to shoot school shootings, which is a whole different topic. But I think a lot of that has to do with taking Christianity out of school. Um, and I think if I, if I were to make the rules in a, in a education system, that would probably be the first thing I implement. You don't, I mean, I believe in freedom of religion and everything, but if you're going to take what the nation was founded upon out of, you know, young kids' lives, like you can't expect a great outcome, especially replacing it with Marxist and socialism, woke narrative. It just, it's not going to end well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You hear, I hear stories that, I don't know how old your parents are. I can guess, but (laughs) my parents are obviously older. And, you know, they talk about when they were in school and even stories that they were told when their parents were in school. Um, I remember when I was in school, the thing that we did, I don't even know if it happens anymore. I guess I'd have to ask one of my, my nieces or something like that. But I remember every morning standing up for the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't even know if that's done anymore. (laughs) You know, like that, that's kind of like a bare minimum, not even going to like the point of religion and reading Bible verses or things like that. But just the Pledge of Allegiance I've seen over the years has become controversial in in certain certain cities, different certain uh, school systems and so on and so forth. So it's that's like a sense of pride, I guess, that is being removed from those kids. And I agree, I have done multiple episodes that focuses on the importance of Christianity. And even if someone doesn't believe in Christianity or, or does not want to to be a Christian, have some type of religion, right? Because the religion sets like your, your moral, your morals, right? Your boundaries, your, your good and your bad and so on and so forth. But those who are just walking around aimlessly, they're more, more likely to be influenced. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's been so many, so many conversations that have been taking place about how to fix schools. You know, the big thing here on the on the right, on the Republican Party that they're proposing is school choice. That is like number one, that's the most popular. You know, certain cities like New York, you know, they have charter schools where kids can apply and try to get in and it's like a special, special program. I know in Florida, because I went to an engineering, like a manufacturing program, you did not have to be zoned for that school to attend it. You just had to apply to that program if you got accepted. And you could get yourself there. You could you could be part of that program. Same thing with like magnet programs and, and everything else. But then you have, I guess, the main reason why people on the Republican side are advocating for school choice. One of the proposals is, hey, let's give you your property tax dollars back or some some form of your tax dollars back. And then you can take that money and go apply it to a different school. You know, like if you want to attend a private school, and you could afford it, especially like with your tax dollars being given back to you, go do that. And it, that all sounds well and good. But when I think more about it, I think, okay, well, if you, because schools are funded, public schools are funded, a lot of their, their money comes from property taxes, state income taxes. Right. If you are taking, get your money back to pull it out of the school, specifically like a lower income area, it's a lower income area and the schools aren't as well funded because the property taxes are not as valuable. So right. is that, so I feel like there needs to be more discussed regarding school choice because if you're given just your tax dollars back and your property taxes are, you know, small compared to another part, more affluent part of the, of the city, then you're not really fixing anything because that family is going to have less money to then go apply to a different school. So then I feel like there would have to be some type of, maximum that could be set for you know to be able to attend a school um so i'm not really sure i guess what the solution is people that i know who do homeschool their kids they you know they talk about oh we can get through the school day in three hours and it's like three hours <laughs> i mean i remember being in school for like six to seven hours and you're doing stuff in three hours right um and i guess that's because you you know you don't have to go at the pace of maybe the um the kids who who need to go maybe at a slower pace, especially if you're like a super sharp kid, super intelligent, and you just catch things, learn things, and can move on to the next thing. Homeschool is going to work great for you because you can just you know churn through and be done. 
so I don't I don't know what the exact solution I guess to to public schools is because there there are issues with certain schools impoverished areas that just being like an endless cycle and the thought of school choice is great because you don't want those children to be stuck there right but I'm not sure how exactly it's going to work to get them out of there so again I'm putting you back in charge of the Department of Education for for the state of Alabama or the state of Pennsylvania, you know, maybe even take you to the federal level if you want the job. But how do you have an answer or a suggestion for how we can make sure that the kids who end up in like these endless cycles in these impoverished areas of different cities and towns can break free from that and have the opportunity to get the education that kids get when they qualify or live in areas that have better funded schools? Yeah, I personally, I, I believe in blue collar work. I believe in the trades. Mm-hmm. Um, I know when Trump was in office, he um, focused really heavily on that in public schools. And I, I couldn't agree more with him. We need to talk, stop telling people that college is the ultimatum. College is guaranteeing you a job. It's usually not the case. Most people in the United States that go to college don't even use their degree. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> and with a with a blue collar job and trades, a lot of times they pay for you to go to school. We need people in those jobs. Mm-hmm. And putting programs in schools that teach kids those basics, you know, about being an electrician, you know, welding, things like that. I I think that would take a lot of impoverished areas and create a new, create a new, I'm trying to think of what I'm going to say. But what about the kids who want to go to college in those areas? How do we get them the education that they need without using like some type of, you know, affirmative action to get them into school? That's where I'm, that's where I'm stuck. <laughs> yeah. Cause if yeah. you give the, if you give the families their, the money, and it's just based like on property taxes, they're still not going to have as much as people who live in other parts of, of the county or, or whatever. So right. then it, does that require then more federal subsidies to get everyone like to the same level? But then as a, like a Republican, I'm, you know, I'm not really supposed to be in favor of all this, you know, like government, federal government being involved in so much, right. but then on the same, on the other side of the coin, it's, Hey, this is about the kids. You know, so like maybe there needs to be an exception to be made because I feel like education is key to everyone's future. Um, you know, I did well in school, but I can see there's gaps in information that I that I don't know, things I didn't learn, things that if I could go back, I would focus more on and develop more um, and so on and so forth. So that's I guess that that's where I'm hung up. Like, how do you I believe like trades are great. I was talking to an electrician this morning when I was putting gas in my car. Um, I told him, I was like, that's something I've tried some DIY projects on my own, but the one type of DIY project that I stay away from is anything electrical. The most I've done is change a light or a, or a ceiling fan, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, like, I, I respect and the abilities and these skills that these individuals, individuals have like that work in the trades, but for the kids who don't want to go to the trade for the kids who want to grow up and become, you know, use their degree for whatever it is, engineering, doctor, you know, what have you, how do we, how do we help those kids get there? I guess with maybe the least amount of federal government help as possible. Well, I know when I was applying to colleges, um, one of the things that make you fill out is the scholarship application. And the first question on that is what's your race? Mm-hmm. And my dream school is Texas Christian University in TCU. Fort Worth, okay. it was TCU. And um, the reason I didn't end up going was because they gave 50 full scholarships to minorities, which I'm not against that. Mm-hmm. But they, it wasn't for being, you know, the top of the class. It wasn't for an SAT score. It mm-hmm. was purely because of the color of their skin. And I think whenever you, I mean, whenever you answer those questions on your application, you know, your, what color are you, um, you know, 
they make you answer questions about your parents' finances, you're more likely to get a scholarship that way. Um, I don't remember what, cause I didn't get any money from them obviously, but the, the, the thing you fill out, uh, for the co- FAFSA. Yes. Yeah. The FAFSA is so reversed. I mean, I get it. I get the point of it, but mm-hmm. they're giving more money to people because of the color of their skin. And I don't get that. And so I think to say that people that live in poverty situations, which in most cases are, you know, Blacks and Latinos, I mean, we're giving them the resources they need. We're giving them more money than, you know, we're giving people that are white. A white person could be in the same situation, but the person that's considered a minority is more likely to get that scholarship. And that's Mm -hmm. the only thing I found whenever I started applying to colleges is I wasn't receiving nearly the scholarship as, you know, the student who was a different color. And so I think to say that, you know, and obviously for public schools, a lot of those are coming probably from, you know, the government, but I think a lot of them are also coming from, you know, alums. So I don't think there's a solution. I think if, if we were to start anything, it would be to implement in high school, a financial, like it's required to take a finance class, Mm -hmm. start learning about debt early, start learning about loans, um, credit cards, things like that. Uh, I mean, most people in the U.S. that have gone to college are in some type of debt, but if we can teach them, you know, how to get out of debt successfully, I think it would help out a lot. Yeah, I have I have student loans still paying on those. <laughs> um, they've been on pause, you know, as, you, as you're aware, like since the pandemic and everything else, I guess that's now two years now. So, right. um, but yeah, there's. I agree. There, there's not there's not just one solution. There's so many things that that go into it, especially like when it comes to educational proficiency. You know, you have things that could be fixed probably within like our, our country's school system and how it's set up. There are things that could be fixed inside of the classroom. But then once you get outside of that and you there are really a lot of key things that could that probably need to be fixed within the home and within different communities, you know, such as I did an episode on the nuclear family, like how that nuclear family, husband, wife, kids, all living in the same household, like that, that's the best platform, the best launching point for success in those children's lives. I was, I had, I was part of a nuclear family until about fourth or fifth grade. I would say the way my parents got divorced and everything else, it wasn't like a typical divorce. It was my, me and my siblings, we were able to still, you know, like, go to school, get good education, you know, both parents were still heavily involved in our lives and so on and so forth. So I'm lucky in that, but there are so many pieces within, I think there's so many pieces in school that could change. And then also there's so many contributing factors outside of school. And it's just, I don't know which one needs to come first. I feel like the stuff that happens, the contributing factors outside, like your home life and what have you, is a longer runway in order to see change happen, right? Like you can't just be like, Oh, well, you know, every, every house needs to have a, you know, a a father and a mother in there. Every, every house needs to, you know, have X, Y, Z. Like you can't just snap your finger and, and make that happen unless you're Bernie Sanders. Um, so, (laughs) so I guess within the school system, I would like to find a way. And again, maybe it comes out with like some type of an exception to the, my philosophy, but if we're trying to help and we're trying to help every student and a lot of the students who don't have a great life at home, don't live in a great area in order to give them as many opportunities during K through 12, before getting to the point of, you know, college and earning scholarships and stuff, we have charter schools. We have like, I guess, special scholarship programs to certain schools, but I'm wondering if maybe there is something that has to happen at the state level to where a child who goes to a lower income like an impoverished area and lives in one of those school districts that they can still have the opportunity because that's all i want is an opportunity an opportunity to receive a better education than they were where they are now 
and then you have the unions, right, that they don't want to see that happen because that puts their teachers at risk of of losing jobs and, and so on and so forth. So there's so many different pieces, so many different components working together. And I, I don't I don't know what to do, but if you, I guess I'm just go back one more one more time. If you could make a change tomorrow for wow. K th- for K through twelve or first grade through twelfth grade, I went to kindergarten at my preschool and not in the public school system. But if you could make a change tomorrow what would that be and that's that's my last question for you so take a second if you could make one more one change tomorrow to impact a positive impact on the k-12 through education public schools in the usa what would that be i would replace teachers that don't appreciate their opportunity to be a teacher with teachers that want to be a teacher teachers that are appreciative of the opportunity that they have within the United States to choose their career path. Mm-hmm. They got to go to college. They, um, you know, have that opportunity in front of them to make a paycheck. And I think if we replace the teachers that are sitting there telling their students, well, you know, the Democratic Party gives you free stuff, you know, if we replace it with teachers that are thankful for their opportunity to be there, worked hard to get there. I think we'd see a real change within the students that come out of these schools. I mean, my dad being a teacher, he sees those students a lot more than their parents see them, you know, Mm -hmm. eight hours a day. He's seeing them, you know, every single day. I mean, there were times where I'd come home from high school and I would see my, my mom worked a nine to five job and I'd see my mom for dinner. You know, I'd go up to my room, work on homework and that was really it. Mm -hmm. So these teachers are seeing these kids more than, than their parents a lot of times and i don't believe it's the teacher's job to parent you know their these kids but these kids are formative they have you know they are learning from these teachers more than just you know what's in a book and i think if we put teachers that love this country want to see this country succeed i think we'd see a big difference of the the students coming out of high schools today yeah, that's one of the th- recent numbers I heard was that on average, when a kid goes to <clears throat> school full time, is that the parents see their child on average just three hours a day, Monday through Friday. And I'm in that situation. My wife and I were in that situation. Our boys both go to a daycare slash preschool and I get them out the door. So I get like the extra hour, hour and a half with them in the morning. But then once they come home from school, they come home late in the afternoon. So from then to bedtime, it's like an hour of playtime and then it starts dinner and bedtime routine. Right. And it's not until the weekends when you get a full day with, I get a full day with them. My wife gets a full day with them, but some instances that's not even the case for other families, right? Like you could work on the weekends and so on and so forth. So I agree. I like the, I like the sound of that where whether the teachers are just burned out or they're not, or they're just not appreciative of the position that they have, they are truly shaping today's youth. Absolutely. And I agree that we need to have teachers in those. We need to have teachers that want to be there. Whether that, I don't know if that needs to be any kind of incentive that goes with that, or just really, you know, the the deep down, Hey, I love teaching. Hey, I love kids. I want to be there to help create and these formative years, you know, and have a positive impact on not only these children, but ultimately that'd be a positive impact on, on our country and then have those teachers in the classrooms. Absolutely. I I think it would be such a great change. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my high school, there were teachers that you could tell they didn't want to be there. That's with any job. You know, there's people that don't want to be there, but they have such an impact on, you know, these kids who are in their formative years. They're, you know, start school at what, four or five years, five years old, Mm -hmm. six years old, up until you're 18. Like that's a lot of time you're going through teacher, teacher, teacher. That's a lot of people to make an impact on just one, one person. And if mm-hmm. we had teachers that wanted to do that, we're grateful for that opportunity. They had to make an impact on students. And I think there are some, I mean, I, I believe my dad is one of those people. Um, but if we had more of them, I really do think we'd see a, a big change. Awesome. Well, Erica, thank you for joining me for this episode. If you could, just please tell people where they can where they can find you, where they can interact with you on social media, 
And again, thank you for joining me for this episode of Counterthought. And we will talk soon. So my Instagram handle is at Erica with a K, Holzer, H-O-L-Z-E-R. No underscores, no periods, no nothing. At Erica Holzer. And thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank you. Please follow Erica on Instagram. Check her out. See what she's all about. She was a great guest. But like she and I talked about, and then like I talked about in the open prior to that interview, there are so many different things that need to happen in order for our public schools, our school system to improve, for the overall education of our children to improve. It's not just one quick fix. We can't just say, oh, we need to fix this within the school system because there are influencing factors that happen outside of school, you know, in the home, in the community. And we can't just say, oh, we need to fix X, Y, Z in the community and then that will fix the schools because there are pieces of the school, components of the school, the school system, the education system that need to be fixed as well. School choice is very popular, but I think school choice needs to be tweaked in order to account for most, if not all, shortcomings, gaps. If school choice is the path we're going to go down, the road we're going to go down, and the Republican Party is, as that's part of their platform, is school choice, we need to also be able to close the gaps for the children in the lower income communities, especially if school choice is just going to be your property taxes, your state income taxes refunded to you. There would need to be some type of, of cap on the price of education. There would need to be improvements also made at these schools because the check given to a kid who grows up on the bad side of town is not going to be as large as the kid who grows up in, you know, middle America or upper middle class or something like that. The school being tied to funding at the state level, there's still always, whenever there's money involved, there is always going to be, I believe, always going to be some type of issue in, in the, um, the allocation of those funds. But I do believe things need to change within the school system. And then I also believe wholeheartedly, and I've talked about this on numerous episodes, that there needs to be a fundamental change in the homes. And also, I would argue, there needs to be changes with the employment and the wages in our country. It used to be where a husband, a father could go to work and his job alone would be enough. His job alone would be enough to supply for the whole family, you know, wife and two kids. But now that's not the case. Even in my own situation, my income requires an additional income, my wife to work in order for us to be able to pay for our lifestyle. And yeah, sure. There's going to be people who say, well, well, why don't you just go out and get a higher paying job? You know, I could, you know, I could do that. I've received offers to do that, but I'm, that's not what I want to do right now because I enjoy the flexibility that I have with, with my current job. So one of the sacrifices I make is, you know, sacrifice a little bit of income for more flexibility in my lifestyle. So I'm not complaining, but across the board, we, it is evident that it requires two incomes. And then that just feeds into the, the issue of parents not spending enough time with their children. And as Erica mentioned in the interview, you know, the teachers are spending six to seven hours per day, five days a week. So 30 to 36, maybe even 40 hours per week with your child. And during the weekdays, Monday through Friday, the most a parent gets if they work and pick up their kid and get home by five o'clock, child goes to bed by eight, nine o'clock, getting just three or so hours with them per day at best. And that could just be for one parent and maybe less than that for the other parent, depending who's gone first in the morning and who comes home first. So there are so many different pieces and so many things, you know, they're all interconnected. So there is no one size fits all solution, but I do believe whatever the solution is, whatever the solution is, the focus needs to be on how to get children, regardless of where they live, regardless of their situation, 
the opportunity, not a guarantee, the opportunity to receive a solid education that isn't just going to set them up for success in the United States, but also set them up for success when compared to the rest of the world. Hi, I'm Brian Kletter, the creator and host of the Counterthought Podcast. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to like it and then also check out these two videos and subscribe to the channel. For more daily content from me, you can find me on Instagram at Counterthought CEO and the official Counterthought Instagram page at counter underscore thought. Thank you for watching and spread the word.